Hello everyone, Vice Drino recently mentioned a playlist of videos put out by Creation Ministries International, which posts questions for evolutionists. One of those questions regarded multicellularity, which brings us to this video. So let's jump right in. The video we're looking at today is titled 15 Questions for Evolutionists, Number 7, How Did Multicellular Life Originate? Let's see what they have to say. Okay, so we're continuing today on our Question Evolution Campaign Flyer, 15 Questions for Evolutionists, and today we're going to do question number 7, How Did Multicellular Life Originate? So just going to read out of the pamphlet here. How did cells adapted to individual survival learn to cooperate and specialize, including undergoing programmed cell death, to create complex plants and animals. And we've got a uh, article on our website that you can look into for more detail. It's creation.com slash multicellular, uh, multicellularity. And uh, if you look up that article, it'll go into detail uh, some of the, the real problems and issues here for this question. This is a big question for evolutionists. Yes, and we'll First off, we did answer CMI's 15 questions for evolutionists back on Darwin Day, February 12th, 2018, the same day I appeared on Apologia's channel. Their question was the same then, nothing new in creationism. Second, the article they cite, Evolution of Multicellularity, What is Required, doesn't itself create any problems for evolution. Rather, it seems that the author, Sean Doyle, who has a bachelor's degree in environmental science, has a hard time understanding technical literature. For instance, he says, quote, Evolution requires more than a mere augmentation of an existing system for coordinated multicellularity to evolve. It requires the ex nihilo creation of an entirely new system of organization to coordinate cells appropriately to form a multicellular individual. Nadelku and Michaud uh, concur. Quote, the current hierarchical organization of life reflects a series of transitions in the units of evolution, such as from genes to chromosomes, from prokaryotic to eukaryotic cells, from unicellular to multicellular individuals, and from multicellular organisms to societies. During these evolutionary transitions, new levels of biological organization are created, emphasis added. Close quote. If you actually go read the paper, Doyle cites the 2001 Evolvability, Modularity, and Individuality during the transition to multicellularity in Volvocali and Green Algae, then you will immediately realize the authors aren't suggesting anything comes about by ex nihilo creation. The paper is discussing reorganizing and changing the expression of existing characters during the transition to multicellularity and co-opting them for new functions. As the paper reads... Quote, we argue here that the unicellular, multicellular transition and the emergence of individuality at a higher level requires 1. Changing the temporal expression of vegetative and reproductive functions into a spatial context. 2. Reorganizing basic life traits, such as immortality and totipotency, between and within lower levels. 3. Decoupling processes from one another at the lower level, e.g. cell division from cell growth. 4 decoupling certain cellular processes from functions and traits, e.g. cell division from reproduction and immortality, and five, co-opting them for new functions at the higher level, e.g. the co-option of cell division for multicellular growth, close quote. If I told Doyle that I made a chair, would he think I literally poofed a chair into existence? I hope not. For Doyle to start off by misrepresenting his own source doesn't bode well for the rest of his argument which is just him putting forth a couple of different basic factors that multicellular organisms need to operate, followed by his constant, unsupported declaration that everything is irreducibly complex. And was it a good idea for him to bring up a paper on the vulvacine algae? Oh well, back to the video. So we'll, we'll do a summary on, on the show today. Uh, we're not going to get into real, real technical things. And just right. have a look at that article and some of the others that we'll... Uh, that will flash up on the screen as we uh, as we get moving here. Now, so so the, the real to summarize then, how did cells become differentiated? You begin evolution begins with a single cell, and then you have copies of that single cell. And those single cells, all they want to do is survive. 
Right. Survival is the name of the game, yep. right? Um, and then you get from there, and at some stage, you have to get from a bunch of single cells that all do the same thing, that are all programmed to survive and, right. and survive more than the others and survive the fittest and so on, to get to a creature that has many different types of cells. That are That's cooperating. That are cooperating. With each yeah. other. Uh, sort of. Evolution as a whole doesn't trend from unicellular to multicellular organisms. After all, unicellular organisms still exist, and they do quite well, vastly outnumbering multicellular organisms, both in terms of species number and certainly in terms of individuals. What's interesting is that organisms exist pretty much all along the spectrum. On one hand, there are simple unicellular organisms, and on the other, there are multicellular organisms with differentiated cell tissues. However, there are unicellular organisms that can aggregate to form multicelled structures like the amoebas, copromyxa, and dictyostelium. They often do this under specific circumstances. For example, when starved, some species of dictyostelium form the multicellular grex, or slug. Collectively, they can move more effectively towards a new food source, or they form a fruiting body where spores are released from the top, thereby maximizing dispersal. So multicellular cooperation provides many benefits when it comes to survival. Heck, even some prokaryotes, the quintessential unicellular organisms, can form structures where cells do different jobs. The heterocysts of cyanobacteria like Nostoc punctiformi are a prominent example of this. In essence, the heterocyst is a cell that stops doing normal cell things so that it can fix nitrogen for other cells in its filament. Sean Doyle may not have known it, but vulvacine algae run the entire spectrum of coloniality. Chlamydomonas is unicellular, while Tetrabena is a colony of four cells. Gonium lives in groups of up to 16 cells. Uterina is a spheroidal colony of up to 32 cells. And Volvox is bona fide multicellular, containing up to thousands of cells, but only two cell types. Somatic, non-reproducing, or germline, reproducing. That's about as simple as you can get for a true multicellular individual organism. And in 2019, Matthew Heron et al. published the results of a study where they subjected Chlamydomonas to predation by paramecium. After about 750 generations, the Chlamydomonas developed multicelled colonies that were too large to be eaten. Similar results have come from experiments with Chlorella vulgaris and Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And various other clades have independently achieved multicellularity, including red algae, brown algae, oomycetes, plants, fungi, animals, etc. In all cases, multicellular forms are closely related to unicellular organisms who share many of the same genes, such as animals and coanoflagellates, or fungi and chytrids. Even among multicellular organisms, there are those with true tissues, like eumetazoa, and those without, like Poriferans. If God created all life, then he sure does like making multicellular organisms for some reason. Uh, yep. You know, we're basically, if you, if you look at our, our body here, each one of our cells contains the DNA for the entire genome of whatever creature you're talking about. So you, you could take a hair follicle from me and you'd have the DNA for my entire it's body. It's all there. It's yes. all there. Or take a piece from my big toe, it's the same. You've got the complete library of information. But we're basically like a bunch of on and off switches. So the, 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 the cells in my nose know to turn on the information for my nose, but not for my yeah. ear or yeah. not for my brain or, or my fingertips or whatever. So, Indeed, your cells are regulated. You have things like Hox genes that pattern your body development so that everything goes in the right place. Interestingly, many of our Hox genes are homologous to those in other animals like flies and squid. There's no reason for this to be unless we are descended from a common ancestor who also had these genes. The argument that an infinitely powerful creator deity chose to reuse genetic elements in a manner consistent with the nested hierarchy predicted by evolution is a laughably bad argument. This, this huge array of complexity to, to cooperate and coordinate all of these things, that's, that's the problem we're talking about here. And, and that's why it's such a big problem for evolution. It's, it's another, in this, this, this flyer with 15 questions, this is another major issue for evolution. Right. So, somewhere along the millions of years, the story of evolution, some cells need to relinquish features that 
that uh, supposedly led to their survival for millions of years. Now they need to relinquish those when they become a part of a, uh, a more complex creature with cells that do different things. Right. First, I wouldn't say it's a problem, especially given the research cited earlier. We can see that the unicellular relatives of multicellular organisms have genes that were co-opted for multicellularity. For instance, coenoflagellates have receptor tyrosine kinases, integrins, and cadherins, all of which function in cell-to-cell -cell signaling and adhesion in animals. In our video on Togeny, we mentioned the paper by Brunette et al. from 2019, which shows that collective cell contraction, a feature that was once considered to be unique to animals, and one that is important for their motility and morphogenesis, is also possessed by some coenoflagellates, and the mechanism underlying this process is conserved in both. Clearly, most of the parts are already there. They just have to be altered in function. Certainly, no creation ex nihilo involved. Second, even if we knew nothing about the evolution of multicellularity, that wouldn't make it a problem for evolution, as in it would not be evidence against it. At best, it would just be an unanswered question. There are unanswered questions for every scientific theory, such as the theory of gravity, especially when it comes to quantum mechanics. Just because a scientific theory cannot give an answer to all questions, that does not mean that any proposed alternative is automatically right by default, especially if that alternative doesn't even give answers to these questions. Creationists have a bad habit of conflating questions with problems, which is hypocritical given how few of their own problems have been addressed by them, let alone resolved. Third, he mentions that some cells must have given up their individuality to become part of a collective. As we saw before, clearly selective pressures like predation can push cells to work together. When your only options are either become a colony or get eaten, then most organisms will choose the option that entails survival. But they can only do this if the option becomes available. Organisms won't become multicellular if there's no selection pressure for them to do so. There's the non-directionality of evolution for you. In a research article published in 2007, Richard Michaud proposed an explanation for how selective pressures could drive cells to form a collective and lose their individuality. What we mean by individuality here is the capability to reproduce as a unit. A colony of cells may be multicellular structurally, but each cell can potentially reproduce on its own, so a colony is not a reproductive unit. Compare this with a true multicellular organism like us, where most cells cannot reproduce indefinitely, at least not normally. The exception being cancer. The somatic cells are in a way the ultimate altruists, sacrificing their capacity to reproduce for the benefit of the whole. But what is the benefit? Richard Michaud's hypothesis proposes that the fitness trade-offs drive this transition as the cost of reproduction increases with group size. He supports this by showing how the gene that controls somatic cell differentiation evolved by co-opting an already existing gene, and by the observation that only large members of vulvacines exhibit somatic cells. As Michaud concludes, quote, the selective pressures leading to reproductive altruism stem from the increasing cost of reproduction with increasing group size. Concepts from population genetics and evolutionary biology appear to be sufficient to explain complexity, at least as it relates to the problem of the major transitions between the different kinds of evolutionary individuals, close quote. Now, we have had, of course, uh, evolutionists write in and, and try to give us some, some answers to we those. We have, and we'll, we'll go through those as well. Answer number one, it was beneficial for cells to work together. Well, you know what? <laughs> they, these are real answers, by the way, that have come in, and we're not screening them or anything like that. These are just the answers that we've received. Well, that's not an answer. Except, here's the thing, it is an answer. Probably the answer. As mentioned previously, this concept has actually been tested in the lab, causing unicellular organisms to become colonial. That's a step on the road to multicellularity. There's no reason for organisms to become multicellular unless it was beneficial to them, and that they've acquired whatever mutations may facilitate that change. Stabilizing selection isn't going to favor organisms who drastically deviate from the norm if the norm works perfectly well. There's no pressure there to favor adding cells together. This is basic natural selection. Do these guys not understand that? Just the, you know, the fact that it was beneficial 
uh, for cells to work together does not explain the origin of what we're talking about here. Of course, it might be a benefit once it's in place, but that is not right. an answer to how it came to be in place. I mean, you know, it, it's wintertime in, in Canada, and, 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 and I've got my coat on, and you say, Cal, how did you get your coat? And I say, well, it's a benefit to me out in the cold to have this coat. Yeah, okay. Did I give you an answer? Your question was, Cal, where did your coat come from? Origins. That's the origin about, of it, yeah. yeah. It, it, the fact that it's a benefit and keeps me warm, that's doesn't not... doesn't explain the origin. doesn't explain the origin. Yeah. So here, the coat analogy is basically, where did multicellularity come from? That's not difficult. That's just a matter of multiple cells associating with each other as a group, and then each cell specialized for distinct tasks. Of course, then the question becomes, how did they do that? How did you put your coat on to modify the analogy? Well, this was already answered previously. The only thing they don't seem to understand is co-option. Structures are, over evolutionary time, co-opted for new functions. With regard to the coenoflagellates, we share a number of genes involved in multicellularity with these unicellular organisms. Clearly, the genes were doing something different in our common ancestor. What happened was that likely some mutation occurred that slightly changed how maybe one or more of the genes functioned. Genetic changes can then affect morphology and behavior, which can then be passed down. In a geologically very short time, the changes can spread throughout the population. As an analogy, notothenioid ice fish evolved their antifreeze glycoproteins from a pancreatic trypsinogen protein. It just so happened that the pancreatic protein had a certain amino acid structure that could also be used to prevent ice formation in the blood. Likewise, the genes for keratin and reptile scales were co-opted for bird feathers, and there are countless other examples of this process. Co-option is rampant throughout evolution, which makes perfect sense. After all, evolution is descent with inherent genetic modifications. The fact that these guys present themselves as knowledgeable on this topic is kinda silly. Um, answer number two um, was colonies of cells that cooperated were the first step well, again, that's... Okay, <laughs> well, there, there's a huge difference between a colony of, of a whole bunch of single-celled creatures and, and a multicellular creature. There, there's a huge leap, but right. one between the other. For example, there's a big jump between the reproductive success of a group of the cells of the same type. If all of those cells are reproducing and growing, that, that's fantastic. But uh, for a, multicell a more complex organism, a multicellular organism, uh, creatures, or, or if there's a cell within that organism that has great reproductive success, that's typically called cancer. You don't want that <laughs> right. in a more complex organism like a human, for example. Or right. I feel like we're constantly one step ahead of these guys. The question of how and why some cells become non-reproductive was already answered. To answer it again, you can see this transition neatly in the vulvacines, from always unicellular to colonies without any cell specialization, to multicellularity with partial somatic germline differentiation, to complete multicellularity. Along the way, we can even see the male and female gametes becoming increasingly more distinct, i.e. exhibiting sexual dimorphism, from isogamy to anisogamy and oogamy. The genetic basis of this development is laid out in the 2018 paper, Anisogamy Evolved with a Reduced Sex-Determining Region in Vulvacine Green Algae, by Hamaji et al., published in Nature. And, and it, yep. it, it's almost like arguing that the, the distance between creatures, you know, if you've got a single-celled organism over here and you've got a single-celled organism over there, if they somehow are, are in close proximity to each other, that's somehow going to explain how they started cooperating and everything. E even the word cooperate implies intelligence. It does, in that person's supposed answer to this question. That okay, I have to stop for a moment to appreciate that Quote, the word cooperate implies intelligence, close quote, is one of the most biologically ignorant things I've ever heard. Do bees and flowers intelligently cooperate? Does a flower decide that this particular bee should take its pollen while giving nectar to the bee so that the two of them may survive? No, of course not. Nor did the chlamydomonas decide to cooperate with each other to avoid paramecium. These are just a few examples of emergence, or specifically self-organization, where order and complexity arise from the bottom up rather than from the top down by an intelligence. 
this phenomenon commonly seen in nature uh, from flocking birds to snowflake crystals is a concept that creationists find particularly difficult to fully grasp. Going back to the beginning of the clip, the answer they were provided with isn't separate from the previous answer. Coloniality is a step towards multicellularity, but as the guys correctly pointed out, there must be a point where genetic unity among the members of the aggregate is achieved. How this works is being studied, but as the 2013 paper, Experimental Evolution of an Alternating Uni and Multicellular Life Cycle in Chlamydomonas Reinhardi points out, quote, We subject the alga Chlamydomonas Reinhardi to conditions that favor multicellularity, resulting in the evolution of a multicellular life cycle in which clusters reproduce via motile unicellular propagules, which are structures that can give rise to new organisms. While a single-cell genetic bottleneck during ontogeny is widely regarded as an adaptation to limit among cell conflict, its appearance very early in this transition suggests that it did not evolve for this purpose. Instead, we find that unicellular propagules are adaptive even in the absence of intercellular conflict, maximizing cluster-level fecundity. These results demonstrate that the unicellular bottleneck, a trait essential for evolving multicellular complexity, can arise rapidly via co-option of the ancestral unicellular form, close quote. So the information is out there, you guys just have to go look for it. As for the bit about cancer, cancer occurs due to a failure to regulate the cell cycle. Importantly, unicellular organisms that aggregate colonially, where members are very different genetically, can be vulnerable to cheaters, who do not share resources or labor, as has been detected in organisms like the amoeba Dictyostelium. Clonal organisms would naturally not have such issues because all the cells in the colony theoretically have the same genes. This is probably why so many multicellular organisms have clonal cells. The prevalence of cheaters would, however, put a selective pressure on honest organisms to enforce the rules. The Ascidian tunicate botrylis mediates recognition of close kin by members of a colony fusing together. In doing so, the tunicate vascular systems must have histocompatibility to fuse, rejecting potential cheaters who are too different genetically from the colony. That's right. Uh, they cooperate. That's um, and and as, as you pointed out, you know, yeah, in, in a multicellular organism, you get one cell that just starts replicating itself like a single cell organism was. That that's cancer. <laughs> that's a problem, not uh, not a solution here. Right. So, um, there's the whole the whole process of some cells now need to stop doing, in, in, somewhere in the evolutionary story, need, need to stop doing what they always have done to survive. So they perhaps get the creature to a certain point, and then and then they have to it's it's programmed cell death apoptosis. That's what I thought he was going one place, but then he completely jumped the track. His issue again seems to be that he doesn't understand natural selection, but then an awful lot of creationists that they might be trying to copy don't seem to understand natural selection either, so maybe their confusion is understandable. Organisms will generally do fine given what they have in a static environment, but should the environment change, that will put a selective pressure on the organisms to change too. If they don't, then the population goes extinct. Why is this hard to grasp? He mentioned apoptosis, but that has nothing to do with what he was talking about. And, uh, and, and for more details on that, that gets more technical, we're not going to do that. But read the article on apoptosis at creation.com slash apoptosis. And, and so now, program cell death. Some cells have to relinquish their existence, their existence, <laughs> what they've always done to survive. So that the an organism can then uh, um, That's right. you know, benefit from, from them. You yeah. know, they get to a certain point, they do a certain job, and then they just basically kill themselves. Um, how did that originate? Right. That's the question. I know the book is outdated now, but if these guys read The Selfish Gene, then that would answer at least half of their questions. Though individual organisms might relinquish their lives, their sacrifice ensures that their relatives will still survive and pass on many of the genes shared by the individual, which is what's important for evolution. I mean, these are not new questions. Because... You know, it, it's kind of like a you know a rocket. You know, you fire the rocket and it goes up, and then of course you, you use up that fuel, and you got outside the okay, you know, the, right, the, gets and, it up and, to a certain point, and then stage two kicks in. Well, the fuel's gone, and, and that thing's a drag now. So we eject that, and we don't need that anymore. So we can continue on our mission to get to where we're going. But yeah, and living things today operate that way, right? Name one 
in, in yeah. When you think about it, though, just like a rocket, that, that all has to be programmed. It all has to be designed. You have to know in advance. You have to be for looking into the future to know, okay, we need to do this now and, you know, and so on. So Right. No, you don't. Everything you said was wrong. And that's the end of the video. This rambling mess had nothing interesting or useful to say about multicellularity, even though it accidentally bumbled into a number of topics that are interesting in their own right. You can use the links in the description to search further if you have any interest, but as for us, we're signing off. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.